Hey everybody, Jen Hatmaker here, your host of the For the Love podcast. Let's dive in here. Uh, super excited to bring back a fan favorite to the pod. Um, you probably remember my sweet friend, incredibly accomplished author, Gretchen Rubin. From her debut in our little community as part of the for the Love of Good Change series quite a while ago, where she talked about taking small steps to a happier life. Hello, somebody. Um, go give that episode a listen after you finish this one. It, it's evergreen. And it was such like a meaty, eye-opening conversation. I thought about that conversation for weeks. Um, so if this is your first time coming across her, Gretchen has been studying basically happiness and human nature for over a decade. Um, her book, which you very likely heard of, The Happiness Project, spent more than two years on the New York Times bestseller list. Two solid years. Um, she's also the author of several other very popular books, including um, Better Than Before, Outer Order, Inner Calm, and The Four Tendencies, which she and I also talked about. She's been featured in tons of media outlets. The New York Times, Oprah, Super Soul Sunday, Good Morning America. I mean, it just goes on and on. Um, and when she's not researching and writing, she's hosting an award-winning podcast called Happier with Gretchen Rubin. So this is where it gets good today, you guys. She's, a, she's essentially a happiness expert. Um, and the thing is, we're all human and we all overlook some of the obvious things. And so I applaud Gretchen for sharing this particular self-discovery journey with us. So here's what happened. And she's going to tell this story. So I won't steal from it, but essentially during a routine visit to the eye doctor, Gretchen realized she'd been taking for granted and overlooking a very key element to her happiness, which was her senses, like her five senses. And so on a journey of basically self-experimentation, she started exploring her five senses as a path to basically a more mindful, happier life, like hooking that back into her the rest of her work. And so her very latest book is called A Life in Five Senses. And it's a culmination of this journey. It's just this very thought provoking exploration of how we individually experience the world around us through sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. And I love this because I think the majority of us take this for granted without even meaning to. I mean, I don't know how often we stop and think about how where, well our sense of smell is working or uh, not, or how well I'm hearing or what I, I am even hearing. I spend a lot of time actually tuning things out, right? And like, when's the last time we just, as we're walking down a street, are using our eyes with intention? Like, what do I see? What am I looking at? What is, what am I taking in? Right. Um, and how, how am I interacting with the world? And so I love this conversation. I love that Gretchen is sharing all of her discovery with us so that we can be become more embodied and use our senses to live a more intentional connected life, which is true, which we can. Um, I'll tell you that during this whole conversation, my brain was just like activated. I, I was literally just thinking about the senses that I tend to prioritize, but the ones that I underutilize and how I could hook into this very available, very accessible portal to living a more meaningful life, really. I mean, this whole conversation is so interesting, you guys. Um, I'll look forward to hearing what you have to say in the comments about your personal experience with your five senses, because as Gretchen mentions in this discussion, we are this is very individualized. Um, anyway, interesting, interesting, interesting. As always, I find her such a fascinating person, and I am so pleased to share my conversation back on the pod with the absolutely wonderful Gretchen Rubin. Welcome back. I'm so happy to see you. Oh, I'm so happy to get the chance to talk to you again. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, this is an interesting project you have. Everything you do is interesting. Your ideas are so creative and innovative, and I look forward to them every time. And they they are so 
funny. They kind of come to you sometimes in like weird lightning in a bottle. Um, let's talk about life in five senses, because this is one of those things where you had kind of a zinger of an idea, uh, kind of out of left field, sort of. I mean, you weren't sitting there in a doctor's office looking for a book idea. (laughs) Can you talk about the genesis of the whole concept and then sort of how it rolled forward from there? Yeah, I was, it was a very ordinary moment. Um, I'm somebody who's kind of prone to pink eye and usually goes away, but for some reason it was particularly bad this time. So I ended up going to the eye doctor and we're just finishing up. And he says to me very, very casually, um, like, you know, remember to wear your sunscreen. He said, well, you know, be sure to come back for your regular checkup, because as you know, you're at much greater risk for losing some of your sight. So we want to catch that. And I was like, wait, what are you talking about? I did not know. I don't know that. And he said, oh, yeah, well, you're extremely, extremely nearsighted. So you're at more risk, risk of a detached retina. And that could that could uh, damage your sight. So we would want to uh, figure it out right away if it started to happen. And I had a friend who had just lost some of his sight to a detached retina. So like I, I knew that I knew about that. And so he, so I walk out onto the street. I live in New York City, so I was just walking home, and it just hit me. I'm like, you know, and intellectually, intellectually, we all know that at any time we could lose anything, and and I also know that like I could have a rich, meaningful life even if I did lose my sight or one of my senses. But it was just at that moment that it hit me. It's like I'm taking it all for granted. I'm looking around me. I saw nothing on my way over here. I was just lost in my head, like in this fog of preoccupation. And as I was realizing this, it was like every knob in my brain just like got dialed up to 11 and I could see everything was sort of crystal clarity and I could hear every sound separated and I could smell every smell in the air. And, you know, I do live in New York City. So yeah, it's a lot lot of smells to choose from. A lot of smells, Uh a lot of smells. And it just like it all came to me in this sort of psychedelic intensity. And I walked home and just that 20 minutes just transformed me and then I got home and then I saw my family and I was like I haven't been seeing them either like my daughters look taller I'm like when was the last time I really looked at them when was the last time I really looked at my husband and I just thought you know I need to get out of my head and like back into the world I need to get back into contact with other people and the world and myself and I thought that and I've been studying happiness for a long time but i I'd, re- I'd started to realize that something was missing. I'm like, there is a puzzle piece that I've been leaving out. And it was like, at this moment, I realized that is what is missing. It's this connection to my body through my five senses. And so that was like, oh my gosh, this is the next thing I need to figure out. I This is fascinating to me. I would say probably in the last... I mean, on the outer edges of it, probably five years, but a little more, clo- a little closer in than that really is this idea, this new practice really, and this, this learning about embodiment. And I, I just didn't, frankly, you and I really did not grow up like this. Nobody really taught us how to be embodied and how to, that's just a, not a thing, right? Like nobody was really teaching us how to be in our skin and in our eyes and in our ears and like, and it's powerful. It's, it's not small. Um, This is not a small thing. Can you, you've hit on something really incredible that I think a lot of the most important practitioners are talking about right now, um, how our senses matter, how our bodies really matter to how we're experiencing life. I mean, it's not disconnected. And so can like, for example, can you share with us some of the ways in which, you know, you and I, anybody can use our five senses to stop snacking, um, to calm our anxiety. These are real things to yeah. sleep better. According to you even become yeah. luckier. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 No, it, there's so much power in the five senses and it's everything from like evoking and like, uh, memories to, uh, you know, increasing your productivity to feel, making you feel closer to other people. But, and then there's all these just sort of like little hacks that are just, you, you sort of figure out. So one thing, okay, you mentioned stop snacking for many, my most neglected sense is taste. Um, I have a quiz that you can take that will tell you your most neglected sense. My most neglected sense is taste. Um, 
but it's definitely one that many, many people feel tempted by. And even for someone like me, who's not that, te- you can kind of turn to taste if you need like a little bit of comfort, or maybe you need a little bit of energy, or you're just sort of bored in the middle of the afternoon. You want to just kind of shake yourself up a little bit. A lot of people turn to the sense of taste and it can become an unhealthy treat for some people. They want to turn to something else. And what I realized is what you're really looking at is for some kind of sensory jolt. You're looking for something to kind of you want a, your cell phone that needs to get plugged into the wall. And so you're looking to your body to give you that so you could turn to a different sense. So like I love the sense of smell. So instead, I now will like smell almond extract or I'll smell a grapefruit or I'll smell fresh towels, just something to like really give me a hit of a beautiful, intense smell. Or maybe you love new music. And so you're like, OK, I'm going to save new music. And then I'll do this instead of like in that three o'clock in the afternoon lull. I'll listen to a couple new songs and that's going to be my way of like overwhelming my senses with something that's going to give me a little bit of a hit of, of delight and energy Um, or like touch, you know, maybe you love working with yarns or other materials where it's just like so satisfying, or maybe you love therapy dough Um, or maybe you want to like pet, like pet a dog or a cat, like, by like you can turn very deliberately to a different sense and it will give you that same satisfaction. Um, And then like for calm, like I think a lot of people, including me for sure, you know, you're looking for ways to stay calm. Like if you're feeling stressed out, how do you get yourself to calm down? Touch is really good for this. And so again, there's things like therapy dough and fidget spinners and pop toys. And and Jen, you were saying like, it used to be that people weren't aware of it. I think people are so much more tapped into it. There's so many more tools and people understanding the, the important role that these kinds of tools can play things like calm strips that you just rub your fingers against. But I found that a lot of times people will hold something just like, you know, as little kids, we have like our little special stuffed animal that we hold on to. I realized that for me, I had a habit that I had never noticed or understood, which is that when I'm feeling anxious, I hold a pen and I will, I'm walking into a cocktail party where I don't know anybody, or I'm like backstage before I give a big talk. Why am I holding a pen? There's no paper. There's no note to take. And yet for me, it just makes it makes me feel comfortable. And once I realized that I did that, now I can go out of my way and say, like, well, let me make sure I have have a pen because I know that's going to help me feel grounded and calm. People do this with clipboards, coffee mugs, water bottles filled with ice water, like a a teacher who had to teach on was getting used to teaching on Zoom would pass a rock back and forth between her hands. There's just something like in the body that can help. Yeah. You know, we can go through our bodies to get to our minds. Mm, that's a great like thesis statement. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And vice versa, of course. Yeah, that's so um, powerful and true. I, I'm curious what, if there was one, what was your most surprising discovery during your personal like self experimentation journey with your five senses was there anything that you i mean you just mentioned oh my gosh i'm walking around with a pen why am i doing yeah. that that's so interesting like yeah. when you just pay attention yes. our bodies are probably telling you something yes right would no, you just, would you discover well there there's two things that astonish me that are that are related so one is the degree to which all of us live in our unique sensory world and and, and maybe you kind of sort of intellectually get it but i mean it is bonkers we do not live in an objective universe um, your brain is telling you what it thinks Jen wants and needs to know. And my brain is telling me what Gretchen wants and needs to know. And it is tinkering with that. So, I mean, as a podcaster, um, I was doing a, a podcast interview and all of a sudden the interviewer was like, oh, wait, let's stop. And I was like, why are we stopping? And she said, well, don't you hear that? And I heard that there was a big siren going out on in front of my apartment building, but I hadn't even heard it. But of course she heard it right away because she needed to know that as the person doing the audio. And she said to me, oh yeah, well in in, in New York, they don't hear the sirens. In LA, they don't hear the helicopters. Because different, or maybe you've had the experience where like you walk into somebody's house and you're like, holy smokes, there's a lot of air freshener going on here. And the person's like, oh, I don't think it's working anymore. I don't smell anything, right? We can't smell our home the way a guest smells it because our brain is like, you don't need to have that information. This is very familiar. We're just going to pull that into the background. We'll tell you if something new happens that you need to know. The brain is very focused on uh, change because that's danger and that's opportunity. But if you're accustomed to something, that stuff comes down. And so 
one person is like, wow, this environment really smells like, like I always worried, like, does my apartment smell like dog food? And I just don't know. But if you take a break, then if you, if I went on a two week vacation and came back, then I would smell it. Um, so that was really surprising. And, and it, related to that was you would think, well, the one thing you would know is your own preferences because you just, you just hang out in your own body. So of course you'd know what you like and don't like. And I was astonished to realize like, like the whole thing with the pen. How did I not notice that about myself? That I had this very, this, this habit that I really did. Or how did I not notice what kind of tea I preferred? How did I not notice? Uh, there's just all kinds of ways that once you notice, you could kind of do what you can. We can't totally control our sensory environments, but there are things we can do to help it suit ourselves or to show consideration for people who are different, who have different preferences. And you're like, okay, well, let, how do we create an environment where both of us can thrive. But like, here, here's an example. If you're doing something that would take you a lot of focus, like let's say you're writing original work or something that's very demanding. Do you want silence? Do you want music with words? Do you want music with no words? Do you have a playlist? Do you want a busy hum of a coffee shop? Like what's your, what's your best sensory surroundings for like focus and productivity. Mm -hmm. what this is such an interesting question. And you know, I'm, I, you and I are both always surrounded by writers. And yes. so I love to drop this question um, into our community and realize we are wildly different than this. See? I like, yes, dead silence. Me dead, too. I, it's dead silence. I don't, Me too. I, I can't at the outer limits of my threshold, I can have very turned down, quiet, instrumental music, no words. At the, at the outer edges, but that's it. I, I, I don't know what that says about me. Is it, what does that say about me? Is it just a preference? Is it a processing like factor? What, what do you, what are you just, what is that? Well, you know, I, I think it's a fascinating question because I wonder, because what's interesting is people who like music more, I would think would be distracted by music, but they often seem to find it helpful. So I don't know. I don't know what it correlates to, but I think that what we can do is say, People are different. And so let me get myself into the environment I need instead of assuming that everyone's like me. B because I think we made two mistakes. One is saying everybody's like me. So as an adult, I say to my kids, hey, you have to turn off the music if you want to study. Even though my child's doing really well in school, why am I telling them that they're doing it wrong if what they're doing works for them? Or we say, well, something's wrong with me. Everybody says, oh, this person I, Jen doesn't, she has total silence. That must be the best way, or that must be the right way. Therefore, I will jam myself into her model, even though I know from experience that I actually prefer to be in a busy home. I'd rather be in a coffee shop. That's where I get energy and focus. It's like, it doesn't matter what's true for other people. That's great, but there's nothing wrong with you, but you need to take the time to be like, okay, well, Maybe I do need, you know, you're like, well, why would you bother to pack up and go to a coffee shop when you could drink coffee for free in your own kitchen? And you're like, because I need that environment. You know, I need, I need that. Or maybe I can listen to busy hum on my, uh, you know, soundtrack. You can go onto YouTube and get like the sound of a busy coffee shop. But for some people, they need to be there in person. So again, it's just like, but how did I not notice, notice these things about myself? Because I just wasn't paying any attention whatsoever. And now that, like you say, it's this mindfulness, this like getting back into our body, we start to tune into these things. And then we start to be able to shape our sensory world to suit ourselves. Um, and then also to show more consideration for people who might be different. So let's talk about this idea that you mentioned, because uh, there's something beyond just a self-awareness. Um, this is actually useful. It can be useful if we sort of harness the power of our senses. Um, let's go back to the power of touch. You mentioned it earlier. Um, you say that this can be so powerful that it literally brings us closer to this idea of the transcendent. Can you, can you unroll that a little? Yeah. So one of the exercise, maybe the most ambitious exercise I did as part of this book, Life in Five Senses, is I decided I would go to the Metropolitan Museum every day um, that it was open. And I did that for a year and then I loved it so much. I'm still doing it. So I go to the Met every day. And one of the things you really see in the Met is the human desire to make concrete the sacred, the divine, the transcendent. And there are reliquaries and there are pilgrims tokens. And there are, there are all kinds of things that are meant to help, help people grasp the transcendent by giving them something to look at, to hold, to buy, to take away, um, that we just want to be able to do that. And 
And so one of the and like one of the transcendent ideals I have is like sort of like the ideas of creativity. And I had this sort of list of what I called indirect directions that were just sort of creative prompts that I would use if I was creatively stuck. So these are things like break the frame or divide it into seven parts or uh, skip the boring parts, things like that. But it, but it was just this thing, this document in my laptop. It was very unsatisfying. I'm like, at some point, I'm just going to even forget I have this thing or accidentally delete it or whatever. So I thought, well, how can I make it something, these kind of transcendent creative insights, how can I make them concrete? So I had been at my parents' apartment and my father had one of those old Rolodexes that are, I love a Rolodex. I was yes, just, so do I. I was just enchanted by it. And, um, and then I thought I'll make, I'll make a, a Rolodex of my ideas. And, and it was so different taking these ideas and putting them down on paper and just like the process of making a physical object that I could actually handle and hold, um, like put me in touch with this sort of these transcendent ideals. That's so interesting. Um, I don't know if, I don't even know if that this, this has an answer, but did you discover any um, sort of trends at all in what you researched and learned? Like, for example, um, did you did you notice that there's one or two senses that we tend to overuse or over prioritize or under underuse or under? I, I really we're all so individual and so unique. But are there any big sort of large sweeping trends in our in the way that we use our senses? Yes. Um, and again, we are very different. Um, and so that's why I did that quiz, because it's sort of like it's, you might not even realize that you have all this low hanging fruit because you neglect hearing or you neglect taste or something. So I did that neglected quiz, for, neglected sense quiz for that. But in general, there are these big things that you can observe. One is that we are wired for sight in the human brain. There's a lot more real estate on sight. That is like we come into the world that way. And if there's like a conflict sight almost always trumps. So sight is kind of the go-to default sense. Um, but that doesn't, but for some people, other ones, you know, they, they are, they, they, they are, you know, really, really dialed into. In the West, typically, um, the most probably undervalued one was smell. Smell was often considered kind of like a, like a bonus sense or like, well, this is kind of a nice thing to have. But what I think is with COVID, that changed. I think that now people, because so many people either temporarily lost their sense of smell or very sadly really had it damaged or had it changed because sometimes it sort of didn't come back the same way. I mean, I think just about everybody either had that experience or knows somebody who went through that experience. I think it's made people far more aware of how much the sense of smell adds to our sense of vitality and connection, how if you don't have it, it makes you feel I mean, a friend of mine who lost her sense of smell for a while was saying how the world felt sta stale and like she couldn't get air into her face because it never changed. And then I sadly, I have a friend who's it's, it, it isn't coming back. She's part of a big study of people who it's not coming back. And she said, like, it's the smell of other people that she misses the most. Um, that it's like, you know, she's like, I'm glad I'm married and have had my children. And like, I'm like all grown up because I think it would be really different if I couldn't smell them. And you just, it's just so part of our experience that you don't realize what it's adding. And so I, and so I think that's actually changed in the last, and also touch. I mean, everybody was like, what does this mean that I can't hug people? I can't shake hands with people. I can't put my arm hand on their back. I can't even like stand close to them. It made us so aware of like all these things, you know, so often we don't realize how important something is to us until we lose it or we fear that we will lose it. And I think that I think that that period really, um, you know, these are senses that that we tend to focus. We cultivate them less, um, but that doesn't mean that they're not like, a, an, you know, an extraordinarily important aspect of our well-being. And I think COVID really highlighted that. Oh, did it ever. I mean, very few of us will ever have a moment where, as COVID did for a lot of us, it robbed us of our taste. You know, I remember when I had COVID um, early, you know, in earlier in the pandemic, and I remember eating food and just all I could feel was food in my mouth that had absolutely no sensation of what it tasted like. One of the more outrageous experiences I've ever had. 
I just, until it's gone, you don't think about just eating an apple. It was so, um, it was such a sensory deprivation well, and, and yeah. And that shows you the connection between smell and taste, because I think a lot of people don't realize like how much this, if you're just tasting, all you taste is like the five basic tastes, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. And if you, it's really smell that gives things a rich, complex um, flavor. And so, yeah, I mean, people have this thing here. It's like, they were, I don't, maybe you did this, like adding things like nuts, like trying to give things texture because otherwise it was just like, ugh. it's interesting when people lose their sense of taste, some people lose weight because taste doesn't, food doesn't taste good. And then some people gain weight because they can't get satisfied. Just trying. Yeah, yeah, what yeah. You, what did you do? Did you, did you, were you trying all the time or did you just turn off food? Like what was your I response? turned it off. I right. turned it, it off. It was, it. it was just. It was so I love taste so much. You know, food is like yeah, a huge you wrote a cookbook. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so taste yeah. is a value. Um, and so it was so depressing to put a bite of something that I know that this tastes good. My brain knows it because I cooked it. I know it has garlic in it. I know it has butter in it. It's salted. This is delicious. It was just my it was such a weird disconnect between what I was experiencing and what my brain knew I should be experiencing. And so this sensory thing is real. How let's get down to brass tacks here because there is a, you know, you are, you're inviting us into this really interesting process of, um, of paying attention of self-discovery of sort of this, this personal assessment of our senses. Once we are, once we're paying attention what do we do with this? Like, what what do we do with this very interesting information available to all of us, by the way, which is one thing I love about your project. Like, we all get to we all get invited into this. We can use our senses. This is not remote. This is accessible. Like There's anybody no time, can, energy, or money, really. Yeah. No, <laughs> this is we're just walking around in bodies. And so we like get to we get to plug in here to your work. Um, but what advice, like what what are you wrapping around this conversation for people looking to like live a more mindful, a more fulfilling life? What does this mean practically? Oh, there, there's so many sort of practical applications to, to it, sort of depending on what you want. So um, just some of the things that I hear from people the most often that they want, I, I, people really want to connect with other people, like whether it's like a team at work who you don't see that much because you're working partly remote or your own family or you're having like a big family gathering or your friends. Turning to your senses is a great way. It's really something that we share. And you could be a grandparent you, and like talking to a five-year-old. And it's still something we share. I think this is one. I don't know if you've seen like immersive Van Gogh or like in one of these color exhibit at, at the Natural History Museum. And they're always saying it's immersive. And that's why, because it's really fun to share a sensory experience and you can do it like very different people can do it in their own way and you can share it. And that's fun. So like I did a thing with my friends, a taste test. Like it's so fun to do taste tests. So we tasted like four varieties of apples and like compared and contrasted and like fancy chocolate versus cheap chocolate and milk chocolate versus dark chocolate. And we talked about things like what kind of junk food did you love as a kid that your parents wouldn't buy you? And it was just such a fun way to connect. It wasn't like the usual dinner party. So you can turn to your senses for that and like find new creative ways to tap in your senses to help you draw closer to other people. Um, another thing you can do is you can use it to evoke memories. You can like, there's a great um, website called Nostalgia Machine and you can enter in a year, like the year you graduated from high school. And it will list all the greatest hits and you can just click on it and listen. And it's so, you, oh, you're like, I forgot about that song, but I know every word, you know? And so you can use it that way. Or like the way um, I went back and bought a perfume um, because it was my signature scent my senior year in college. And like, I don't even wear it. I just like to smell it. Um, and people do this deliberately, like, oh, you're going on your honeymoon, get a new kind of scented body lotion that you only use on your honeymoon. And then for the rest of your life, when you, you know, you can use that to bring you back to that. time. Or like my sister, um, she was on, she and her writing, she's a writer, she and her writing partner had to go on a cruise for research, you know, nice work if you can get it. So they were like, okay, we're going to have a signature drink, the espresso martini. And then for the rest of our lives, we'll remember this because this particular sensation. So that's one thing you can use it as we talked about to like 
give yourself calm and focus. You can use it to give yourself energy. Like one of the most classic ways is to use music. That's one of the quickest, easiest ways to intervene in mood. So you can have this, like I made a Spotify playlist of my audio apothecary. So when I needed to cure the blues, I could just listen to this, these songs. They were like my, my happiest songs. Um, and so, um, so yeah, there's, there's all sorts of practical. And then there's just even little things like, um, let's say you're in a, you're in a crowd of people and you need them to quiet down. Like you're going to give a toast before a wedding, or you're like giving, you've got a room, a conference room full of people who won't stop chatting, just blowing a harmonica. It is like, we're like kindergartners who know that like everybody just like, and you don't have to play a song, you just blow. And it's much prettier than like, uh, a fork hitting a glass or just like yelling at people, tell everybody, here's you. It's like everybody just instantly is like, oh, it's time to be quiet. And so there are all kinds of like little things and big things that we can do once we realize that this is this is sort of an approach we can take. You can think about, well, how would I do this from the outside, in, from the body, from the five senses? I think sometimes we go from the inside. We're always trying to change our thoughts and our perspective and our attitude. I think that's much harder than just changing your actions. To me, it's much easier to change your actions than it is to change your attitude. Yeah. Start with the physical space. Yeah. yeah. It's so tactile. Oh. It's so easy. Here's another great one. Um, and mm -hmm. I just actually was, re I just figured this out on my own, but then I just actually read a study where they studied this with college students. If you're tempted by your phone, if you feel like, you know, I really should spend less time on my phone, a lot of times people will say, well, just put your phone away for like six hours a day. And you're just like, okay, that that's not realistic. I need my phone like every minute of the day for this thing or that thing. Turn your phone to grayscale. It's very easy to do in settings. You just make it go in black, white, and gray. And what you realize is that it's going to be a lot less appealing if it's in black, white, and gray. First of all, it's much harder to use because you're not able to use color as like a guide. And it's also much less appealing because things like photographs aren't interesting and like they're just not as it's just harder. And if you have a kid who's like constantly trying to grab your 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 iPad or whatever, turn it to grayscale and just say, oh, I'm sorry, honey. You know, it's broken. We'll have to get it fixed. But it's just it's not as it's just not as appealing. But it's something that's completely within your power. To, it takes one second to turn it off and turn it on. And it's and it's good. It reminds you of how much color adds to our life because it's it really it's it's very um it's very it's like watching your grandparents old black and white tv set it's just it's just not as good an experience so true and those are intentional and crafted colors i mean they're designed to draw oh, yeah. our attention and to oh, keep it 100% um, and they're they're so vivid and 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 yeah, yeah. crystal and beautiful yeah. yeah this is such an interesting conversation i'm thinking about the practitioners who have understood this for a long time. I've got a really good friend who is an occupational therapist and she works with um, elderly people primarily who have lost their, they're in some form of dementia. And so she's works with them on memory. And so she, she's told me so many stories about how she will be with one of her patients who is, who cannot remember their own name not the name of their children, nothing. They're, they've lost so much and the words just cannot crack through. But what she will do by using the help and listening to the help of her, the patient's family is um, music from something, some incredible memory from their wedding or from a play they were in when they were 19 um, or um, touch or she uses their senses and she finds her way right into their memory. And just like that, this person who not one minute ago did not know where they were is singing an old song or telling a whole full story about something that happened 71 years ago. Um, and it's fascinating. Well, and I just heard a story the other day. Um, someone emailed me to say, because we were talking about the sense of smell, the sense of music is very like that's so interesting. It's like it shows that the, how br the brain just is operating in all different parts of the brain. So those parts are unaffected. But she said with a sense of smell. So she was was like FaceTiming her mother, you know, every few days. Her mother was sort of sinking. It was was showing signs of dementia. And she said so that the, the, the conversations were very much the same. Like they were sort of always took the very same pattern. It was hard to like introduce new subjects. 
But she said when she went to visit her mother, she found an old container of like uh, of bath powder in her mother's drawer. And she smelled it with her mother and was like, oh, my gosh, remember this? And they smelled it. And then she said the next week her mother said like, oh, do you, she 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 mentioned it. It was like it was able to make an impression in her mind and kind of like unlock something that she hadn't been able to access. So again, I think that that's a great suggestion. And and definitely people like who work with people in palliative care and things will talk about soft, warm blankets and how comforting that is. So it is a thing where it's it's always a, like whenever we have some kind of challenges to say, well, is there a five senses? thing I could think of it. Another way I did this is I needed to give a gift. I had a friend who was just going through the worst period of her life. And I'm like, what do I do for someone like that? And I thought, well, I'll make her a sensorium gift. I'll give her like five gifts, one for each sense, just something to kind of delight and comfort her. Because, you know, sometimes it's just like, you know, it was like a little hand cranked music box, you know, where you can see the mechanics playing like you are my sunshine. I'm just like, it's just a sweet, pleasing thing. Um, but I don't, I, I was just absolutely stumped. Like, what do you get for a person like this? But then when I thought, oh, let me do a sensorium gift, I Im immediately thought I'll get, okay, three, a set of three scented candles. I get this like cashmere blanket. I'll get the cr the hand crank thing, like this beautiful thing of like postcards. She loves, a, you know, art. And it all kind of fell into place. And I just felt like, it just felt comforting. And that's what I wanted to give her. I like, wa I wanted to like give her physical comfort and I realized that the I could do it through these these possessions that I would send her, you know, the box. Yeah. So it is it, it's always a good it's a good strategy when we're stumped for what to do. A hundred percent. I um, I think this is absolutely fascinating. And I I love this conversation. Again, it's so accessible. So can you just. We've scratched the surface, you guys. I mean, there's there's so much under this. There's so much to drill down into and to learn from. So, Gretchen, can you tell everybody where to get the book, where and also where to find more about you, like just to to follow you and to learn from you, because you have this body of work that is so fascinating for just human people living on this <laughs> earth right now. And I count myself among them. Yeah, no. It, Yes. Um, yeah. GretchenRubin.com. So I have a site. It's just my name, GretchenRubin.com. And you can read about my books and I have a podcast. So you can, you know, check that out. Happier with Gretchen Rubin. That quiz that I mentioned, the neglected sense, because that was so much fun to create. It's like got all kinds of like cool sensory aspects to it. Um, and then I'm on social media as Gretchen Rubin all over the place. And I have to say, I love to connect with listeners and readers because I feel like the world is my research assistant. People are constantly sending me insights and examples and observations and resources like i'm constantly like reading things and watching things and listening to things that people have sent me so i love to connect um on the, on the subjects of sort of happiness and human nature and the five senses and it is it's just like like your friend talking about the the using the music it's just it's so interesting to how hear how people in very very different contexts can find these very useful ways um, to put this into work so that we we can make our, you know, as you say, does it take a lot of time, energy or money um, and to tap into this? And of course, not everybody has all five senses. Like we all bring our own complement of senses to it, but it's sort of like whoever we are, how do we make the most of, of, of who we are? Perfect. Um, so everybody listening, I'm going to round all these links up for you in one spot. So you can um, follow Gretchen everywhere and get the book. And it's such an interesting conversation piece too, as you start to pay attention to the the senses of the people that you love and that you live with and that you work with. Like it, this this is really an interesting portal um, into connection and into um, living in a way that is both like physically like pleasing to ourselves, but also to the the people around us. And so, okay, last question, Gretchen. Everybody gets this one. Everybody, every series. Um, uh, you've answered it before, but however you want to answer this today, this can be a serious answer. It can be ridiculous. Um, and my answer would probably change hour to hour. So what is saving your life right now? Oh, mm -hmm. well, one thing that's saving my life is going to the Met every day. It's like my recess time. It's like I use discipline to, to like let myself be undisciplined. Um, 
so it's like my snow day um every in the middle of every day i get to go and just wander around and i find that if i'm really anxious or have a lot on my mind it's like when i walk through the double doors i'm just like okay just let that go right now i'm just gonna walk around and just see what i can see and experience what i can experience and i always leave feeling kind of refreshed and with my sense of perspective restored and so I find that that's, that's really helping me, really helping me and delighting me every day. It's useful, but it's, but I really do it for fun. I don't do it for the utilitarian reasons, but it's nice that they're there. <laughs> what, a, what an idea that you had to go to the Met every day. Well, of course, I mean, I'm incredibly lucky that I have the time and the freedom and I live within walking distance. So I'm grateful for that every single day. Um but I lived, I lived here for a long time and I sure didn't go to the Met every day. So now I'm very happy, very grateful that I'm doing it now. That's a great answer. Um, thank you for being on today. It was just so good to see you. It's always so good to talk to you. I love learning from you. My brain has just been firing this oh, entire good. conversation. <laughs> I am just running through the Rolodex, if you will, of my own senses and what delights me and what I'm underutilizing. And it's just so fascinating. So thank you for coming on the show. I love having you. You're always welcome. Oh, well, thank you. I always enjoy the chance to talk to you. Thank you again. <laughs>